uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joel Chili. I'm a school teacher in Pennsylvania. I've been teaching over 10 years. Um, I'm actually an online teacher. My whole my whole career as a teacher has been online teaching. So for those of you who've done remote learning uh, because of COVID, uh, I weirdly thought that that was actually a better choice career-wise all the time. I just do that every day, <laughs> COVID or not. So I really like teaching online. Uh, so I hope you enjoy learning online. I've been with Thimble a little more than half a year. Uh, you know, I absolutely love computer science. I love 3D printing. I love, uh, you know, coding and I like video games and all kinds of tech stuff. If it's techie, you know, tech things are my life. So thrilled to meet you all, all of you again. You know, I will keep an eye out for anybody who lets me know like, hey, I'm a first timer here. I'd be happy to uh, give you a little extra guidance whenever, you know, things pop up. All right. So uh, our slides today, our topic today, um, just to kind of jump in here, I'll show you the parts you need. So you get a moment to get set up. We're going to use in our screen. We're going to use the button. We're going to use the dial. Uh, and we're going to build. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into my agenda here. We're going to build a heads or tails simulator, um, which this kind of takes me back a little bit to whenever I was in uh, statistics in high school. So if you can if you can picture, you know, what this math class must have been. You know, we did a lot of things like, OK, what's the odds of rolling? you know, um, a 10 with two six-sided dice. What's the odds of rolling, you know, um, two sevens in a row, things like that, right? Was what I did in this math class. And I really enjoyed it, I thought it was really neat. But uh, sometimes, you know, the uh, projects, right, might be something where it's like, well, we know that flipping a coin is 50-50 heads or tails, but, you know, go ahead and sit down and flip a coin a hundred times and write down heads or tails and, and see if you really get 50-50 for you know the percentage to which you know like high school age me thought boy that's a lot of throwing a coin in the air for no reason right and what's cool is that you know we have the ability to simulate some of these things now with uh technology that you know we can see hey with a thousand flips how close is it to 50 50 percent with 10,000 flips right how close is it to a perfect 50 50 percent that's kind of neat right um so um, include wire.h, uh, that's a library, right? That would have to do with, I believe the LCD screen might use that one, but don't quote me on that. I got to take another look and see um, where I've seen that particular library used before. But anyways, uh, so we'll be doing some heads and tails based uh, stuff and turn it kind of into a little bit of game, all right? So the core fundamental this week is a piece of code. Try to make sure these fundamentals become something you'll see in multiple build-alongs, right? So if you've been to build-alongs for let's say half a year, stuff like that, right? You know, you're gonna start seeing certain repeat things. So um, incrementing is a pretty common thing we do. We take a variable. So in this case, my variable is called total and we set it equal to a number at the start of our code. So let's pretend total is equal to one. Well, if I write a line of code total plus plus, that's kind of a weird thing, right? Where in math class do you see plus plus, right? I'm not a plus plus button on my calculator, right? Uh, what's plus plus do? It's just saying increment the total variable up by one, right? And this is variable had been called, let's say uh, count. And we said count plus plus, or if this variable had been labeled score and we said score plus plus, it's just whatever that variable is, increase it by one. So you can see if we take total and we say plus plus, you can see I got little red blocks illustrating what happens. What does total minus minus do? We take one away. So increments are a big part of a lot of coding things. Like today, for example, we want to tally how many heads, how many tails we see. So every time we flip heads with our you know coin simulator, we're going to go plus plus to how many heads we've seen. Every time we flip a tails, we're going to do plus plus to how many tails we see, right? And it's just basically, it's an accumulation variable, right? We're accumulating you know, one, one more, plus one more, plus one more, plus one more. So let's look at some code that uses this, okay? So yeah, wire.h is involved whenever we go ahead and, and do a project that uh, has an LCD screen. It's just part of the, um, you know, starter code that we have on our, our uh, Thimble projects, that's all. It's not in every project, but you'll see it pretty commonly whenever we're using the, uh, uh, LCD screen, I believe it's in every single one of them. So, uh, but good question. So, so you might not know every library that's out there, but usually 
not everybody memorizes them all. We just go ahead and look them up. There are all kinds of documentation online help us, you know, see that kind of information. All right. So um, why does it only add by one? So if we wanted to do by two or by three or things like that, right, we would probably say variable equals that value plus three or plus five or whatever increment we want to count by. But increasing by one or decreasing by one is a very common thing that we do, right? Um, so it's two pluses because instead of saying that value plus another value, we're saying increment by one. So plus plus simply means increase by one. So here's my code to uh, count every time I click the button, okay? And it's gonna just spit out the um, uh, number on my screen. It's a very basic piece of code here. And for those of you who've never coded much uh, using the LCD screen, I'm going to kind of block off a couple things and just put some notes to help you, um, you know, see what's going on. So up here, this is this is some of the, you know, quick little setup stuff I need. The two um, lines that say include, these are just pieces that we use product after project that help us import the instructions that talk to our screen. And then my variable is button socket equals four. We'll connect our button in just a moment. These pieces that I just circled uh, have to do with the color of our screen. We're setting it to 50% red, green, and blue. That makes it light up white. So those two parts, you may be new from previous projects. I wanna focus on just this one variable. So I'm saying I have a variable called count. It is a type known as an integer, meaning it's a number, and it's equal to zero at the start of my program. Okay, so right now, this is the only thing that I'm worried about you knowing up to what I've explained. So ignore the upper part, you may know it from other projects, but I want you just to hone in on a couple pieces you can learn absolutely today. Now setup, we've learned in other projects. This is where we specify what pieces of our project are an input or output, things like how big is our screen. Our screen is 16 by two, right? We set the color for our screen. You know, we do little things like in this case, we're putting our, um, you know, uh, cursor to print on the screen in the top left corner. And we're gonna just print out the zero that is count to start. But I think, again, you can skip this part and focus on the two pieces that I've blown out into, you know, the magnified view of these little arrows, okay? And so I want you to know simply that in our loop, we are saying, if you push the button, do count plus plus. So we're gonna take our count variable and increase it by one. If you push the button, we're going to increase our count variable by one. Now, the next couple lines, you might not remember or never have seen before, so I'm not gonna stress you over them, but all they do is they wipe the screen clear, reset to the top left corner and print the new count variable. And then this section here, again, I'm not gonna stress you over it, is just to, you know, uh, wait 50 milliseconds, fraction of a second for everything to reset. Okay, so you're focused on, if you're a brand new coder, or if you're still learning some of the code pieces, just focus on, we have a variable that is zero. When we say that variable plus plus, we're gonna increase it by one, and then we're gonna spit out the new number on our LCD screen. That's all, okay? If you try to learn code, you know, um, skills and too many at once, it can get confusing or frustrating. So I'm asking you if you're first or second timer here, just focus on the, the key fundamental of this week, which is incrementing variables. You know, it'd be great if you um, know every line of this code, but I don't know why uh, you would know so much if it's your first or second week. So, you know, it's, uh, don't stress yourself out. You can, you know, learn it in steps. That's why we do a new fundamental topic every build along, all right? So that's my advice to you. For, for those of you who've been with us for a while, push yourself, see if you know every line of that code. If you do, great, that's awesome, right? So here's my board, I got it all set up, uh, fresh and ready, nothing plugged in to get started with a project. Okay, here's my LCD screen, here's my dial, here's my button, this is everything I'm gonna use today, okay? Now, I happen to still have a wire left over here from last time, but if you never plugged in your LCD screen before, right, you just kind of slide this in from the side and then you're, you're set to go, okay? Now this wire goes into any spot. Every LCD project we do, we plug the LCD into any of these spots marked I2C. It's actually commonly said also I squared C. I squared C is actually more accurate because it's because of what the acronym stands for. I always forget what the full acronym is, but it's actually like IIC. And so they say I squared C, but I find it really hard to say I squared C. So I often say I2C and so do a lot of people. Sometimes it just helps to say something that's a little easier on your tongue, right? 
All right, other wire. I need to connect the button. If you look at your code, the button variable uh, is at the, it's the third line of the code, right? If you look at that code, go ahead. What's that? Can you put the code in the chat? Oh, I haven't finished building the circuit. I'll put the code in the chat in just a moment, okay? Um, so uh, the code, I know we just had it up on the screen a moment ago, so you can't see it because I didn't put it in the chat. I see why you asked, good point. Okay, I was gonna say that when you do look at it, it's on pin four, okay? And D4 is top left corner. All right, so there's my layout. Now, those of you who know this routine, right? We're gonna go ahead and plug in our board now, open up your Arduino software. Let me go ahead and put the link in the chat. Is there anybody out there who's never copied code from Pastebin before? Let me know in the chat so I know to demonstrate it for you. Because it is kind of boring to watch if there's nobody new to tell them that again, right? <laughs> so there's your there's your code, all right? And uh, to start a fresh Arduino program. All right. I'll go ahead and demo it. It's not its not gonna take that long. I just wasn't gonna bore anybody with Pastebin if we didn't have any new, new students. All right, so everybody who had learns before you know it does help to see it one time, right? So we're gonna help out our new student today. All right, so this is what Pastebin looks like. It's a website where if I give you a link, you can then see a whole chunk of code, right? at that website rather than me put it in the chat and you try to copy it out of there. Yeah, I get a lot of banner ads on this website. I'm sure you will too. They can be a little annoying, but what you're looking for is the section marked raw paste data is the easiest one to highlight and copy. I click inside of that box, I hit control A to highlight everything. See, I highlighted the whole raw paste section. I hit control C and now I can go ahead and put it in my Arduino. Now I wanna warn you, okay? If you aren't in raw paste data, when you hit control A, it tries to highlight the whole website. You wanna click inside raw paste data, hit control A or command A if you're on a Mac. Control C, you're gonna copy it. Let me go ahead and switch over to my Arduino software and I will demonstrate what it should look like when you paste something. Now, first time students, I'm gonna warn you, if you didn't do our orientation, you might not have the LCD library installed and you might get an error when you run your code. If that happens to you today, please stick around in the last 10 minutes, I'll happily help you install the LCD library. So if you did our online orientation, oops, wrong share. I wanted to share my, um, Arduino software. Okay, there we go. If you did the orientation off the website, you have it installed. If you didn't, um, you know, I'll have to help you today. Anyway, so you erase everything out of your Arduino software and then you control V paste the code you copied from the website. All right. So for any new timers out there, nice, easy rundown of what to do. Okay. So now whenever I go to upload it to my board, I hit the little arrow and this code will ask me, do you want to save it? That's a common thing it does every time with brand new code. And you can just save it, anything you want. But anyways, if you get an error, see how mine said done uploading down here, okay? If you got an error, that's because you're probably missing the LCD library up here. Um, and you need to install that and that's part of our website orientation. So if you need help finding that, just let us know in the chat and we'll gladly link you back to the website instructions on how to install your Arduino software how to install the LCD tools, all right? So let's get over to my desk and we're gonna see this increment variable in action. So my variable was zero at the start of the program. And every time I click the button, my variable gets a plus plus, okay? So I click once, notice my number goes up by one. Click again, click again, click again. This really should not aston astonish you in any way, right? Uh, because this is just something, you know, that we've probably seen you know, similar kind of functionality. But now you know how the plus plus operator works. So plus plus is happening every time I click, okay? All right, Rotello family, if you don't have an error, but your screen is not showing information, check that you have your slider on five volts. And I appreciate getting a question about if your screen's not showing information, because I also imagine that for any first timers or someone who's getting to use the LCD screen for the very first time, might not know that if you're on three, take a look what happens. <laughs> Nothing, right? So you gotta be on five volts because the screen is built on five volts. Um, if you still don't have it there, if you have it on five volts, um, if you switched it over, make sure you hit this reset button to restart the code, okay? And then, you know, 
see if it solves it for you there. If it did, did not solve it for you, there's nothing wrong with the code. Um, I would recommend, have you had LCD issues or has your LCD worked normally for you in the past? Because if it has um, worked normally in the past and suddenly it's not, that's a different problem than if it has never worked. So let me know and I'll be happy to think about a solution for you, okay? Um, all right, so that's our incrementing variable in action. It does plus plus. Go back to our slides. So all it does, when we say plus plus, takes our variable and it goes up by one. Now our loop is actually checking for counts. So we're looping the instructions. Hey, did you push the button? You did? Go ahead and add one to our, to our variable and update the display. That's what the loop is doing. I'm not as worried about everybody knowing every line of the loop, because again, our goal today is to learn about incrementing variables. But for those of you who've had enough experience to kind of like, uh, uh, so, oh, Raymond, I got you. You said that you had an uh, issue where your board wasn't on. So um, I take it you figured that one out. Um, so Rotella family, how about you stick around for the last 10 minutes and I'll ask you some additional questions and maybe we can figure out um, if there's something physically broken, maybe, because since it worked for you before, um, but like the past two months, it hasn't, um, that's a different story than it never worked at all, right? So I might ask you to do some physical like inspection on particularly, you are welcome to take a, a sneak peek ahead of me, but unplug your wire and look at the physical pins. There should be four pins in that white house or housing is the expression, white little plastic housing, that rectangle hole. If one of those pins has been bent or broken, that would be a reason why your screen would no longer work. All right, so this code says plus plus um, and it goes up. Why don't we go ahead and edit the code? So now you know how incrementing works. Plus plus means go up by one. Why don't we go and edit it? We can change it a couple of different ways. So even Ellie, um, I'll tell you in a second here. I never put three pluses. I don't know if that's valid syntax. Okay, Ruto, the family, I'm glad to be able to confirm that. Um, okay, so Evie and Ellie, your problem is that it's trying to upload to a, a location that it doesn't see a device on. Go to tools, port, and see if there's another option. You're currently on the option that is the numbers 14101. Uh, see if that is even in your port view. Sometimes um, when you disconnect and reconnect your board, you need to go to tools, port, and reselect. It should be another thing labeled USB modem and then numbers, but the current numbers you have, it says it doesn't see a board there. So try again and let me know if that uh, error goes away for you. So um, folks, while you're troubleshooting, this next piece is not essential for everybody to do. You know, we wanna make sure we get a chance to show everybody the activity for the day. If I need to help people at the last 10 minutes with some additional troubleshooting, I'm always happy to do that. But I'm gonna go ahead and show the next thing that I wanna do, which is to show people, if you change count from plus plus to minus minus, right? Now we're gonna go the opposite direction. Instead of going from zero to one, two, three, four, five, right? We should now go backwards, right? Um, so Ruto Hello family, I, I, I got some ideas. I'll check with you in the end. Don't, uh, don't sign out right away. Uh, I might ask you some additional questions or you can try some other code uh, to just troubleshoot for me, okay? So I've now reversed my increment variable. Now it works in reverse, I'm going down, okay? And you might be thinking to yourself like, well, you know, it went immediately into negative numbers. You know, can I see it subtract from a, a positive number? Well, yeah, that's really easy. Go back to your code. So see where I edited count to be minus minus? Well, up here count started at zero. So why don't we just make count start at 50? <laughs> I'll upload it again. Now, what I'm doing here is not something that I'm sharing in the chat. I'm just showing you what it's like to play with code. And I encourage you to do this when you have some time to see, you know, what other things, you know, that you change that change the way things work. So here it's now going down, you know, every time I push the button, right? And I started at 50 because I just rewrote my starting variable. Let's go ahead and change one more thing. This will humor you a little. Okay. So I'm gonna leave my starting variable at count 50 but I'm gonna do count minus minus two times. See how I have count minus minus two times in a row? Now I'm gonna subtract two every time I click. It's the same code, I've just asked it to increment twice instead of once. I didn't add like a number or anything, I just literally just wrote 
minus minus, count minus minus two different times. All right, so let's go ahead and look at my, my desk. And there it goes. I'm now incrementing in steps of two. Okay. Why, why play with code like this? We call this kind of like tinkering, right? It's a way to help ourselves, um, you know, uh, it's a way to help ourselves uh, learn learn things just by, by playing around with it. So I'm gonna check in the chat here. Uh, so Evie and Ellie, if you were able to fix it by changing your port, just give me a shout out that you're uh, getting what you expected. And um, I see the suggestion there about uh, checking for loose connections. I agree with that advice. Always a good first step is to just make sure that everything's fully plugged in. But I got a feeling you, you might already know that you are or are not fully plugged in. So I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna stress over, oops, might just be loose. Yeah, um, Rotolo family, I got a feeling it might be something broken. So, but if you wanna double check your wires, try another wire in the kit. All right, so uh, here I'm gonna do um, the next fundamental skill. So we did about incrementing. Now we wanna talk about random values because heads and tails are gonna be randomly selected zeros and ones in our code. So what I've done here is uh, add some random values and I'm gonna give you this code in just a moment. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll put the code in the chat just so anybody who's ready to run it can go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, also good advice. Try one of the other I2C pins. Uh, but again, if you tried that already, right? Um, oh, interesting that it was getting hotter than usual. See, now that's where it could be physically broken but we might wanna consider you know, what caused that. But anyways, okay. So here's the code for, um, we're now gonna pick a random variable, a random value, so a random number and, and increment with that. Or, or I'm not increment with that. What am I saying? I'm getting ahead of myself, trying to pay attention to the chat and pay attention to my slides. We're not incrementing anymore. This is the second topic of our fundamentals. This is about what are random numbers. <laughs> And what does it look like to make a random number? So we're gonna to need to also make random numbers today. Okay, so we have two pieces of code that have to do with random numbers. First is that in our setup code, we have to actually tell our program that we wanna make random numbers by saying, let's make a random seed, meaning we need to generate our random starting point, which you don't know yet what that really entails, I'll tell you, okay? Um, and then, we're going to put a random value into the variable num. So num is just a variable we're gonna use in this particular project. Uh, and it's gonna be a random number, zero, one, or two. I know it's written zero comma three. Three is the boundary where it cuts off the possible values, okay? So um, let's go ahead and run the uh, code. So I put the uh, link in the chat, but I'm gonna send it one more time because I know we had a couple chat messages come in. Uh, I'm gonna switch to my desk and demonstrate what this code does. Uh, I too upload them at the same time as you. So I do the same thing. I always like to actually, I like to open paste bin just like everybody in the room and copy and paste the code because if I accidentally send you the wrong paste bin or things like that, if I'm copying and pasting the same code, I find out real quick, <laughs> right? So it's a nice, um, you know, like a, a fail safe that I, I don't accidentally, um, you know, find myself getting a different result than you. Okay, so every time I click, I should get a number zero, two, zero, one, one, two, one, right? So sometimes it's the same number twice in a row. So you don't see any difference, right? But as I'm clicking, you can see it's jumping around zero, one, and two, okay? So I made random numbers appear on my screen when I click. And we're gonna use just zero and one to represent heads or tails, but I wanna teach you how random numbers work and then we're gonna go ahead and make our dice simulator, okay? So random numbers are kind of an interesting conversation because the way they work, um, how will it become heads or tails? We'll identify zeros to mean heads and tails to mean one or one to mean tails, okay? So we're literally going way back so whenever you were in math class growing up and you did number lines with uh, greater than and less than type of uh, statements. Do you remember doing these when you were probably in elementary school? And a teacher would say to you something like, all right, I want you to shade this for greater than three. That's my example on the top. How would we do that? We drew a circle around the three, right? 
because it's not greater than or equal to three, it's greater than three and we shaded to the right. You remember doing these, right? Well, now we have a range that's basically saying, uh, you know, X is going to be a random number that is greater than or equal to, oops. Um, yeah, yeah, greater than or equal to zero, but less than three, right? So it doesn't include three, but it does include zero. So when we say random zero comma three, it includes the first value and it uses the last value as a boundary, okay? Uh, all right, <clears throat> so that explains a little bit about the code we just saw. So whenever we go to make the random numbers zero or one, we're gonna write random zero comma two to get the value zero or one, okay? Because two would become our boundary, all right? Now this is interesting to learn about random numbers. So you and I live in the physical world where random things can happen. For example, if I roll a dice or if I roll um, or flip a coin, right? The outcome is genuinely random. If I tell a computer, pick a random number, the computer doesn't really have any external forces to create random events, like how we have in the real world, right? Um, in the computer, right, um, what it does is it, it has a, a, a sequence of what we call pseudo random numbers. They're numbers that appear random, that are stored in the computer's memory, in this case, our Arduino's memory. And whenever we start a program, you recall I said there was a line of code we used called random seed. Well, random seed picks out a random spot in the sequence of numbers and then follows it in order, right? So every time you generate a random program, it picks a new starting point, right? So the starting point might be here and then it goes forward from here, right? Uh, it just basically changes where we start in our list of random values. Now, that may sound to you strange, but the list is very large and we actually pull a real value out of um, the uh, uh, atmosphere to pick a random starting point. So this is kind of a fun little surprise here. Random seed analog pin three a3, we don't have anything connected to A3. So the actual pins are reading a, a sort of um, range of values based on just uh, the noise of the environment, <laughs> that it doesn't actually have a sensor on A3. And so it actually does produce random values there. So although the computer itself can't make random things, it can start with a random reading from pin A3 and then use our random number list, the pseudo random list to then create what appears to be random numbers. All right, so I noticed I got a hand up, I think in the um, participants there. You know, I will I will uh, admit that I, I did not see it till now. So it might've been from a while ago. It is Alex, did you have a question for me? Or is that from earlier? Just put it up. Okay, go ahead. So I was, so you said it reads a random, um it takes it from the atmosphere. So is it, do you mean like with the servo when we unplugged the dial, how it just went crazy because it didn't have a reading? Yep, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly how that works. Excellent connection. So that's why that does that, is that it's pulling, you know, a non-sensor input. Um, I really need to tie that project and this product together. I think maybe I should uh, start the day with that servo going haywire like that. You know, when we did them last time we did these lessons, we actually didn't do that random thing where we disconnected the sensor and let the servo go haywire. I kind of did that on the fly this year, but it's a great connection, isn't it? So, all right, so here's our code that actually simulates our heads and tails. By the way, we're, we're through our fundamental. Now we're gonna go ahead and make the project, which is the heads and tails generator, and we'll end with the coin flip game. So uh, we're about the halfway point. For those of you who might be new to this format, you know, our fundamental is the learnable thing of the day, right? So it gets a lot of time and then we use a couple examples of project and a challenging project, basically we call it a challenge, that are built around those fundamental skills. So here is a heads and tails flip simulator, okay? Um, basically, each time you click the button, it's gonna spit out heads or tails. Um, it's going to appear random, right? 
Um, but, you know, um, there is one slight problem and I want you to go ahead and run this code so that I can show you that sometimes what's fun about code is that we, you know, can change things and make things better. And in this case, let's run this code and you'll notice that whenever you get two in a row of a certain value, like if it goes heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, you can't really tell if you press the button or not. So although our goal of the day is to see some random generation of heads and tails values using, um, you know, random number generator, I do want to illustrate something that is a really common sort of coding error, which is that whenever you have a random number showing up on the screen, you saw it earlier when I did the um, zeros, ones, and twos on the screen, that if I got the same number twice in a row, you couldn't tell, did he click the button? Because uh, nothing changed visually for you to actually recognize that something had actually happened, right? Uh, that can be really frustrating to your user if you're designing an interface for them, right? So here I've run the last code that I just put in the chat, and I see heads, I click, I get tails, I click, well, I got tails again, but I couldn't tell that it actually changed, right? There's heads twice in a row, three times in a row, four times in a row. I can't tell. Am I just not pushing the button hard enough, right? Do you see the problem, right? That's really kind of annoying, isn't it? Right? I got tails like four or five times in a row there. I just kept having to click, hoping that, you know, is it getting my inputs, right? So what we want to do is kind of extend our, our, you know, concept of the week here about random uh, numbers and so forth and add a little, a little extra conversation here of like, hey, we should ask ourselves, when you make random messages on a screen, how can you make your user recognize when the message is the same twice in a row? Um, for example, if we had the word change to flipping coin for a few seconds before the outcome shows up, right? Or, um, you know, uh, telling the user flip again, uh, you know, after their, their outcome is displayed, either one of those would help the user feel like they got a clear, like, hey, when I press that button, something really does happen, right? Oop. I uh, accidentally, I think, hit my mouse twice in a row there. All right, um, okay. So here are some changes that fix the user experience, okay? Um, particularly, I've added um, a couple spots where a message of click to flip and flipping pop up so that the user feels like activity is happening, right? That says to them, click to flip. And the word flipping pops up. I don't want to burden you over, you know, the little nuances of how I inserted these messages as much as I want to just paint the picture for you why your user would like this kind of an experience over, for example, uh, a, a random project that doesn't communicate any uh, sign. Because this is something that, so something that I do in my free time, I guess that's probably the wrong term. Uh, something I do on my like weekends and stuff like that as an interesting side gig. I'm sure you've heard before, right? You know, we live in an era where people usually work multiple jobs and, you know, they, they make comments like, I'm a school teacher. I hear comments like, oh, today's students will have, you know, 12 different jobs in their lifetime. And it's like, well, yeah, I, I live that too. Uh, so I actually do some, some um, embedded electronics work as like a consultant on the side. And, you know, sometimes you really do have projects like this that, you know, rely on random output um for for you know a uh, uh, display to a user in some kind of capacity um and you have to consider how does your user know that a new value was generated if it randomly picked the same one twice in a row and this is a good example of that is change what messages they're seeing on the screen so my screen right now is showing click the flip and when i click it goes flipping and then i see a result this is flipping and then i see a result so now there's no longer a question of did i push the button hard enough Right. I equate this with, you know, what drives me nuts at the uh, intersection whenever you go to cross the street and they have that little button on the um, post. That button doesn't like change color to, you know, it should light up or something to say like, hey, we got your request. You want the crosswalk sign to come up, right? If I don't have any kind of indication that my button press was detected, I'm going to push it again. Why do elevator lights? or elevator buttons light up when you press them, right? It's clear communication to a user, right? So you have to consider that if your goal is to develop, you know, embedded electronics in the real world, this is that your user's experience is a key part of it. So, all right, so we're getting down to the challenge here and the challenge is gonna be a little more elaborate, right? 
Um, so, boy, I'm having one of those days where I keep accidentally scrolling my mouse when I mean to click. Okay, so this demo is actually built around both increment and random because now our demo is going to uh, count a number of flips for us, okay? Um, so here are all of my spots where I use random and incrementing. This is a lot of code, right? A challenge is not something that every build along attendee can follow every line that was here um, because you know we want to show you something advanced that uses that fundamental skill, right? Um, but those of you who have been at build alongs for like three months, you might look at this and say, I remember I saw something like this in another project in another project and we learned that and we learned this and we learned that, right? So if you're in your first couple of weeks of build alongs, right? This is a pretty neat challenge because that key fundamental you learned today is part of it, but you can see that over time, you'll learn a lot of other code skills to be able to understand these bigger projects. So let me go ahead and put this code in the chat. We are gonna have to add a dial to use this code. So the dial goes on A0. So there's the code in the chat. Let me switch to my desk. Have one of those moments where I'm like, there's my dial right in front of me. And yet I looked all around like as if it wasn't there. You've done that too, I'm sure, right? We all have those moments where the piece you're looking for is right in front of you. Here's my dial. Dial's gonna go on A0. All right. I need to load the new code. I haven't loaded it yet. I'm getting ahead of myself a little. All right. New code uses the dial. This is now a uh, sort of heads and tails simulator. It's no longer just a one heads or tails flip, but rather we're gonna see, you know, like a, a, a sequence of multiple flips, all right? So it's saying to me with my current dial setting, simulate 55 flips, that's a lot. Okay, I'm gonna knock it down to 10, all right? Simulate 10 flips. And yeah, sometimes when you spin that dial, you can accidentally get stuck between two options and the click to run might be a little blurry, okay? Um, there, I got like a normal view of it. Sometimes that happens. Uh, it's just kind of a shortcoming of having such a wide range on the dial there. So if you get a little bit of a blurry screen, uh, it's just a little bit of a glitch in the, the way that it updates the, the display. Don't let that bother you. And I just ran the you know simulation. I got eight heads and two tails, right? So 10 flips, let me crank it all the way to 100 flips. I'm gonna click to, to run the simulation. Nothing quite like watching the, you know, so it's telling you that what the result is of each flip and then it's tallying them on the top, right? I had an 80 to 20 split with only 10 flips the first time. That was way off, right? I got perfect 50-50 out of 100 flips. Now it's not always gonna be a perfect 50-50, that was just luck, but I'll let it run again while I talk to you. So what are we actually seeing here? But we're generating heads and tails flips, okay? Um, and tallying them. So we're incrementing a total heads and a total tails count with plus plus in our code, which I showed you with the highlights that it's in there. And you know we're going through a sequence of 100 flips. So I got 51% heads that time. So it gets pretty close to being 50-50 the more we do. But still, you know, you'll have outliers where you get like, you know, 55 heads and 45 tails and you're off by a large margin there. So one thing that's fun to see is if we tweak the code around a little bit, I like to do this. Um, so this reminds me of a time where I once did a lottery simulator to see, you know, what were the attributes of winning numbers like what was the common average of all the winning numbers? What was the, you know, uh, difference between the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth numbers of the lottery? And I did this by generating thousands of simulated lottery picks and analyzing the resulting data, uh, which is super fun to do, by the way. So I like the idea of what happens if we run for a thousand heads and tails flips, right? Uh, instead of running just the hundred that I can do. Well, it'd be super boring to watch. So we got to cut our delay way down. So I've, you know, changed the delay here. And I actually am overriding the dial reading values with um, just 1000 in the code. I'll put this code in the chat, right? I don't see any reason why um, 
you know, you guys sit there and, and comb the code for these little little changes I made, right? You know, um, that's gonna drive you a little bit up a wall there, get a little 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 worn out if you're like, I can't find that spot because this is a long piece of code. So if you want to take a chance, open the latest link I just gave you, okay? Now I'm gonna run it too, and this one's gonna go faster because we slowed or sped up the speed by cutting the delay between flips down, and we're gonna simulate. 1,000 flips. <laughs> um, and if you want to go back in and rewrite 1,000 to 10,000, be my guest. And you know, you can actually go ahead and simulate for 10,000 flips and see how close do you really get to a perfect 50 50. And by perfect 50 50, it probably won't be a perfect 50 50, but you'll be like, you know, 50.5% versus 49.5%. It'll be a lot, a lot closer, right? So this is my simulation for 1,000 flips. And if you, you can see my screen is going rapid fast. I'm already 200 flips done, right? We've got this thing going a whole lot faster than it was when I was doing uh, zero, zero to 100 flips, right? So this thousand flip simulator is fast, right? This is, this is the way it could be or should be. If I don't update the display, it goes even faster, right? We can, we can really get the zoom through. And so I got 50.6 tails and I got 49.4% heads. So I'm getting really close to a good 50-50, right? You would almost, you know, say that that's that's you know close enough to the theoretical value of 50-50, right? Uh, if you're ambitious enough, rewrite the code, do 10,000 flips. It only run for a couple minutes. Um, it doesn't take that long, right? That's what's great about computers, right? They'll do all those flips with no problem. <laughs> they don't. They don't mind. It's just it's just a short little computer operation for them. For us, you got to throw it in the air and look at it. You know, can you imagine if I did 10 or a thousand actual coin flips, I'd still be going by the time you're, you're you know, uh, awake and headed to school tomorrow, you know, <laughs> it could take a long time. But if you, you know, decide you want to run it for more, right? You know, that that you can see that you get closer and closer. The more flips you do, the closer it gets to being a, uh, you know, 50, 50 point percent with only maybe 0.1 percent of error, right? That it gets, it gets closer and closer, right? So I have one last piece of code for you because I like games. I like games a lot. I think code when it's game oriented can be more fun. So here is my code that basically, um, you know, uh, uses the dial for you to call heads or tails. You're gonna turn the dial left or right to switch between call heads, call tails. And then you're gonna click the flip and it's gonna tell you if you called it right, or if you picked wrong. So it's gonna be like actually playing heads and tails, you know, like against somebody, but in this case, you're Arduino, right? And sure enough, I highlighted here to show you, it uses the random and the increment code from our fundamental. And you might be looking at this code and saying, boy, that's some long code, right? And you know, yes, it's long enough that I can appreciate that, you know, it might not seem, um, you know, like a, a easy to learn quickly today, like our other projects. But this is just a fun challenge piece to show you what's possible, right? If you learn all this code stuff and you have an idea and you say, you know, I want to make a heads and tails game, which one day I said, I want to make a heads and tails game and here's the result, right? So wait for my code to update and it says, dial to select, click to play. So I start my program, it says call tails, but if I spin my dial, it's gonna choose call heads when I cross the halfway point. So half the dial is heads, half the dial is tails. So I'm gonna choose heads, and it says you picked heads, flipping, coin is tails, you picked wrong. <laughs> okay. Well, it was just tails, I'll call heads and try my luck again. Coin is heads, you called it, right? And see that's giving me a score here. I'm gonna call heads three times in a row, see if I get, ah, I got a positive score of one. All right, I've called heads three times in a row. Let's let's try my luck on tails. Coin is tails. I got two in a row. Well, three in a row, actually. I got my score up to two. So see how well you can beat the machine. You know, if you find yourself with a score of 100 or 500, you've been calling, you know, heads and tails with a better success rate than, you know, kind of breaking even. On a long enough timeline, you usually break even on these things. But if you find some kind of magic rhythm there, you might be psychic. <laughs> So anyways, uh, that's, uh, you know, my last demo. Um, let me go ahead and see if I have any other last things I'd like to show you. Um, I think that, no, that's, that's my, that's my last, uh, 
piece to show you. I already showed you the highlights where the uh, random and incrementing parts of the code were. So we got a couple of minutes before I'm going to ask people for troubleshooting. Who who needs troubleshooting? Tell me, you know, uh, what what parts did you find interesting? Did you prefer seeing it do a thousand flips, or do you prefer seeing it turn into a game where you could play against the computer? Uh, I'm always curious, you know, whether or not some students like the you know, more math oriented, like, hey, let's do a big a giant simulation. And some people like games, like I'm a game person, but I also know it's important to do some simulations of like, you know, math related things. So I'm just interested to see if anybody wants to chime in and give me some feedback of what things you found the most interesting there. I make games out of a lot of stuff. See, it goes a little bit of both, right? Some people like, like to see the simulation more than they care for the game. Uh, and some's the other way around. So I just thought, might give me a chance to see what kind of student you are if you're somebody who has more of a like hey i love games or if you're somebody who's like oh i really love the math um you know i just i just it's a nice way for me to get to know a little bit about you so i thought i'd just ask which one you like um between the two so um all right then um well if you want to give me a shout out in the chat tell me what you know of the two applications of the skills you found most fun game or simulation i'd be thrilled to hear your thoughts and that's it for today so the next 10 minutes, I'm still here as we wait for our seven o'clock students to arrive. So if you had a troubleshooting question or an issue, and I know uh, Rotello family, I told you I'd be interested to check in with you about your uh, LCD screen, but anybody else who also needs something checked or would like to check in about some details, please stick around. Um, but if you're, you're free to go if you you know don't have any troubleshooting. Um, and uh, Rotello family, I'm probably gonna just start jumping in with questions for you. Uh, Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for saying thank you. That was nice. Bye, everybody. Bye.